all about the Qumran scrolls. How many of you guys have been to Qumran before? All right, awesome. So you guys have seen, you guys have seen what I'm talking about. This is an awesome place. So let me bring your little memories back. Recognize it? <laughs> if you've been there, you won't forget it. Okay, there's no other place like that. Except on the surface of Mars, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe on Mars, you got it. It's dry, it's rocky, it's arid, it's absolutely just bone dry. Mm -hmm. In the middle of January and February, mm -hmm. it's like being inside of an oven. Mm -hmm. It's just how it is. <laughs> But, you know, when the rainy season comes, amazingly enough, this is, what you're seeing right here in front of you is called a wadi, okay? This is a ravine, a natural ravine, and you will see that as the rain comes, and rain comes in Israel only once a year, well, not just once a year, but in one season out of the year, okay? You will see these little, little streams would come down from the mountains, and they would form into these rivers in these wadis, and the wadis will flow with this muddy water. But then as the water is gone and it puddles up, the flowers blossom. And the spring is just like, this place will be covered with poppies and things like that. You don't think of a desert blossoming with beautiful flowers, but that's actually what happens in the springtime. Because all the water that comes in in the winter so hopefully this is, uh, for some of you, this is just a trip down memory lane. So when we're talking about Qumran, this is what we're talking about. And I'll show you a little bit more on the map. Uh, when we talk about Dead Sea Scrolls, this is it. This is the Dead Sea. Uh, you see a little cave right here? Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the caves where the scrolls were found. And so nothing fancy, just a hole in a rock. <laughs> but somebody decided to make it a library and preserve some of the most ancient manuscripts we have. Now, uh, I have two sessions with you guys, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of Qumran and how the scrolls were found, how they were discovered. We're gonna talk a little bit about the time and the place and the significance of that discovery. And it's, it's just a great story just to know it, how, it even came in, how these things came into our hands, let's put it that way, because these are amazing documents. And then, uh, and then we'll read a little bit from the Qumran scroll. So I'll teach you a little bit about how, how they work. Uh, and uh, we'll, have, we'll do a little bit of reading. Now, in the, in the next session, the second session, I'm actually going to talk more about what's in the scrolls, more, much more about content, and what does that content actually teach us, what it, how, how it helps us to understand the ancient world. And then we're gonna do some more reading. I'm, I'm gonna do a little samples from different passages in the scrolls with you. Because if you really want to understand the scrolls, you have to taste them, you have to sample them, like everything else in life, right? Yes. So there you go. Uh, so Qumran, um, a little bit about the history of these scrolls. Uh, if you're looking at this picture, this may be familiar to you, this is a, a jar, that's what the scrolls uh, were stored in, in these caves. And the story of these modern Dead Sea Scrolls, as we call them, that this discovery really begins with two Bedouin shepherds who found the first seven scrolls in 1946 completely by accident. That's the cool part of the story. So this guy is a shepherd. He's got sheep wandering all those little, you know, rocky slopes as you can see. Yeah, there's vegetation growing on them. And so uh, one of the sheep just kind of goes and hides and he doesn't know where the sheep is so he wants to, to draw it out. So he starts picking up little rocks and throwing places. If you know anything about the sheep, they're a little bit skittish. So they see something, they kind of like start moving around. So, but they're also quiet. So he could be just grazing somewhere, he can't see it. So he starts throwing it into all the different places. And as he picks up one of the rocks and he throws it into a cave, he thinks that, you know, the sheep kind of, or goats there, by the way, too. They're kind of all rock climbing, too. Ibex, right? Ibex, you know, there's, I mean, Ibex, you don't farm Ibex, but you know, they're, 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 they're pretty industrious animals. They get places. So he starts throwing rocks and as he throws one of the rocks, he hears broken pottery shards. It's like throwing a rock at the window, and all of a sudden you hear a window crash, and you're like, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So that's what he hears. He hears broken pottery. So he goes to investigate. He climbs, it, climbs into one of those holes, and what does he find? He finds jars, like the one you're seeing right here. And these jars are not for food storage. What they contained 
were rolled up scrolls. Just like the Torah scroll we have here on the rollers, imagine that without the wooden roller, just all being rolled up into one big roll inside that jar, sealed up. So it's pretty cool, uh, but completely by accident. So here's the guy who found it. I got to check out his mustache. That is Danny. awesome. Absolutely Danny. dandy. The wolf. The wolf. <laughs> Mohammed Eddi, the wolf. He's, got, he's even got a really cool nickname. I mean, you guys got to realize this, this Bedouin guy has really got it. And so him and several of his friends, they knew once they discovered these jars, they knew they found something really old. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know how much it was worth. So they took it to the nearest place where they could get some money. They took it to Bethlehem. Okay? And in Bethlehem, they wanted to sell them. So they found this guy who is a cobbler, but also an inspiring antiquities dealer. This is how it is works in Israel, by the way. If you haven't figured out, every cobbler is an antiquities dealer, you know. <laughs> so they figure out they're gonna sell it to him. Uh, and his name is Kondo, or actually Khalil Iskander Sahin, but that's too long for Americans, so they just call him Kondo. Uh, and he wasn't sure if the scrolls were worth anything. He didn't know what they were. I mean, he doesn't act, he, he understands it's ancient, but he has, has no idea its value. There are lots of scrolls out there. There's lots of writings. Jews make a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, so what does he have? He has no idea. So what does he do? He buys three scrolls from the Bedouins. Remember, they found seven, okay? He buys them for less than a hundred bucks. Um, He's like, I don't know if I want to do anything with them. The worst case scenario, I'm going to make them into, uh, you know, shoe liners because he's a cobbler. It's leather, okay? I know leather. I can, I can work it. You know, he's like, it's not worth anything. At least I can get some something to line people's shoes with. So, you know, it's, he's making a good investment, less than a hundred bucks. Uh, so, but but this guy is one of the main uh, Bedouin sort of say they found it, and, and then they kind of teamed up and and said, all right, let's sell them. So here's Condo. Uh, Totally different mustache, by the way, but you know, but still a mustache, yeah. so, and really cool hat. Yeah. So Kondo uh, eventually resold these scrolls to the collectors, and then purchased more scrolls in 1947. Now remember, 46, they find them. 47, they still trying to get them around to sell them. So one of the scrolls he sold to the head of Saint Mark's Monastery, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, and in 1948, this head of this Jerusalem monastery showed the scrolls to the scholars from the schools of oriental research. This is a really big learning society. It's kind of like SBL, only they're more archaeological and they deal with a lot more uh, material culture items, uh, excavations and things like that. So, um, so school of oriental research is still a society, it's still around, it's a big one. Um, and so he showed it to the scholars at that time, they estimated them to be about 100 BCE. They looked at them, and the story is really actually fascinating. They couldn't even see the scrolls. When he brought them to these guys, they were on one side of the border, and he was on the other side of the border. And through a fence, he showed it to them. And they look at the scrolls, and they said, oh yeah, this stuff is old. Very old. How old? About 100 BCE. That, that's, that's how good these guys were. They were able to look at the script, they were able to look at the scrolls, and they're like, by, just, by the way it's written, they were able to say, this is really old stuff. And we've never seen things like that. This is really amazing. So um, they knew they got something special. And so some of the scrolls were eventually brought to USA in 1949. But still, not everybody really understands what, what they are. So in 1947, the Bedouins sold more scrolls. Remember, they found seven to begin with. They sold only a few, then they probably found more, because once they find them, then they go find digging some more. And they're the only guys who know where they found them. They're not gonna tell you where they found them. So they go find some more, and they sell them to another dealer named Fedi Salahi. And so uh, he offered those scrolls to the Israelis, and he brought them to Professor Sukenik at the Hebrew University. And this is the first time the Jews have ever seen the scrolls, because prior to that, there's still no Jews involved, okay? Uh, and so Israelis purchased those scrolls, and shortly after they purchased, they realized what they got. They knew they were ancient, they had no idea what was in them. They just purchased them blindly, as just an artifact. But once they started reading the scrolls, they said, what we've got here is absolutely amazing. We don't have anything to compare with this. So the Dead Sea Scrolls basically were discovered in this era that I want you to realize, that was a very turbulent period of history. It was messy. 
1946-1947, the first cave with scrolls was discovered. Now, this was the same year when Israel declared independence and when UN partitioned Palestine. The partitioning plan of, at that point, it wasn't even the UN, it was the League of Nations. This is when this is happening. And in the middle of that, they're finding these ancient scrolls. Do you think they're kind of a little bit busy with other stuff? <laughs> yeah, they're busy about fighting the war of independence, surviving, you know, just making their lives. So, so here's the story of the scrolls. It parallels the history of Israel, okay? 48, 49, the first scrolls were evaluated by the scholars during the time when Israel was in the middle of the War of Independence. The reason why they couldn't cross the borders and they had to see them from the fence because there was war zone going on. They had to just sneak into an area and say, okay, here it is. Um, and of course, they don't let them hold on to the scrolls because they, they consider how valuable they are. So in 1949 to 52, excavations now begin. People realize where the scrolls are, so they start searching in Qumran and then covered five more caves with many more scroll fragments as Israel now is rebuilding after the recent war of independence. So imagine this, this moment, yet they're still finding their time to collect these scrolls and, and work on them. 55 to 56, archeologists and Bedouins find five more caves with more ancient scrolls in Qumran. And at that time, of course, with the Suez Canal being closed, Israel was engaged in the Sinai War in Egypt. So they're digging for scrolls and fighting a war on the other side. I mean, it's just like you can realize how the loyalties are just a little bit split in this moment. So here's a, here's a fun little tidbit of history about the scrolls for you. Uh, in 1954, through an advertisement in a Wall Street Journal, an American mediator bought four scrolls on behalf of the State of Israel. So there's also politics going on. Nobody wants to sell them to Israel because we don't want the Jews to have them. Anybody else but Jews, okay? So a mediator does buys it on behalf of the state of Israel, and the scroll, scrolls were sold by the head of a St. Mark monastery, the same guy who bought them, okay, from Kondo, who bought it for 100 bucks for $250,000. That's a pretty plush That's a lie. serious, serious <laughs> profit, right? <laughs> serious profit. But you know the thing is? That was cheap. How much is that today? I mean, it's, it's a lot of money today, but yeah, it's still cheap. Yeah, so, but look. Yeah, it's cheap. It's still, it's, we're still talking about $250,000 for the type of material that they bought right now if they try to resell it. You have no idea what the price will be. It's, there's no value. I mean, there is no value. No I mean, what do you put on You can't. You can't evaluate historical documents from 2,000 years ago. You just can't, especially the originals. I mean, copies is one thing. We're talking about originals yeah. from 2,000 years ago. So this is fun. So, uh, and of course, today, many of these scrolls that we find, they're in museums, they're in private collections, they're in educational institutions of all sorts, universities, you know, the Shrine of the Book, you know, has a lot of them, Israel, Israel Museum has a lot of them. So some of the scrolls are preserved in labs. You won't ever see them in museums at all. Some travel the world as exhibits, and others can be viewed at the Shrine of the Book in Israel. So uh, there are a lot of scrolls, and when I say scrolls, I actually mean fragments because we're not talking about full and complete scrolls. A lot of times they're just bits and pieces, okay? But this is a fun little advertisement. This is just a straight scan straight from the newspaper. Look at that. Four Dead Sea Scrolls. Biblical manuscripts dating back to the 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift for an educational or religious institution in, or an individual or group. And it just gives you the place to send the money. <laughs> this is pretty cool, right? Yeah. This is history, okay? I mean, in the miscellaneous for sale, right? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I got these scrolls I want to sell. <laughs> Probably, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. You can you can ratchet it up a few. It was a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money back then. It's true. But they also don't fully have, don't fully even realize what they have because the things that they found is one of a kind. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's like we got Jeremiah, then we got Jeremiah, then we got Jeremiah. We have War Scroll. There's no comparison. Nobody else has a War Scroll. It doesn't exist anywhere else. This is the only copy, and you will never find one another, another one like that. That's it. We have Temple Scroll, we have this, we have that. You know, it's just, there are some documents that we have copies of and, and other, you know, bits and pieces of. Other documents, we have one and no more. So Peter, just, this is, um, I, this is a point I've been confused about for some time, um, is that the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're really, you can't just go to one place and say, oh, these are the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
they're really all over the place as far as where yeah. they are now. Like if yeah. they want to go, they're 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 spread out. It's yes. not like it's not just the Israel Antiquities yes. Museum or anything. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Israel Museum has a bunch of them. Okay. Uh -huh. London Museum has some of them. Okay. Some of them are here in America. Some of them are held in universities, like various research yeah. centers in universities that either own them or they're on loan from whoever owns them. Because the point of having these scrolls is not just to have them, it's to study them, yeah. mm -hmm. is to read them, is to translate them, and to put together all the research and say, okay, how can we reconstruct this puzzle, you know, sort of say. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it took scholars, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, they found them in, in the 40s, and just now, you know, a few years ago, they actually finally published the full version of all the scrolls that they found with translations, because they fought over translations for several decades. Because the translation is like that, you know, like you translate it and you, and you argue over it, and it takes years for scholars to settle on a translation they're happy with. Plus, you start rearranging words because they're little bits and pieces. So yes, they're not all in one place because not one entity owns them. They've gone to various places because different dealers sold them to different people, and they've gone different different places. So it's not like one, you know, entity owns all of them. Uh, it is a national treasure of Israel, but it's spread out all over the world, like a lot of things, <laughs> sure. like the Bible, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's not like that. So, so Peter, the story is awesome. Yes. Um, in the uh, museum in Israel, hmm? all those scrolls that are everywhere, you know, the pieces. Like, Only some. You right, have to realize those these. Aren't real, yeah. though. Those mm. are there are some on the, some. And if you go to Israel Museum, you can see the real scrolls. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that are reproductions, uh, the, the, but but they will tell you on the on the exposition which ones are which. Like the Great Isaiah Scroll is the real deal, which is why the actually the way the museum Shrine of the Book is built is to not only house and display the Great Isaiah Scroll but also to preserve it because believe it or not, in case of a rocket attack, it turns into a bunker. The scroll goes into the earth deep below gets covered up by layers and layers of concrete and metal and and then it just you know disappears basically so if anything goes on that scroll is safe does that make sense yeah because imagine imagine hosting a treasure that's one of a kind that can be destroyed with a rocket attack yeah. you know that somebody just Hezbollah decides to launch a few rockets and boom there goes the greatest biggest scroll we have yeah and the other thing to keep in mind is that the scrolls are in various states for Repair like the Great Isaiah Scroll, remarkably intact, and of course they can roll it around, uh, open it up around the entire room. Whereas others, you've got little tiny bits and pieces that can only be yeah. read with lasers. That yeah. they're sitting there using lasers to try to read the script and then you know put together like a jigsaw puzzle while yeah. not actually physically touching them. The fragments, they're tiny, they're they're faded, they're deteriorating because they're so old. They're in various states. You know, when we say scrolls, it makes it sound like what we have, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not really accurate. It's more of little bits and pieces of scrolls that we found, you know. And some of them are in, in, in bad condition, and so they have to be preserved scientifically. They have to be, you know, uh, uh, sort of say kept for for future research still, because we're still, you know, trying to decide on what some of them mean. <laughs> so the so-called so scroll, Dead Sea Scrolls were actually found through eleven different caves in the area that we know as the Dead Sea. Uh, in Qumran, and the caves were spread across very dr this dry and desolate mountain ridge, which is opposite of the sea, about 20 kilometers or 12 and a half miles east of Jerusalem. So it's actually not that far from Jerusalem, okay? But because they were sealed in these jars, they were not exposed to any sun or humidity or anything like that, that's why we have them. Anywhere else, they would have been just dirt. They would have rotted away into nothingness, just dust. But because they were stored in this area, they survived for that long. So, uh, and what, besides the scrolls, what the excavations have, once they started looking in that area and they found the scrolls, they started digging around, they found a large compound, which was previously inhabited by the community, who probably collected and then placed the scrolls into the caves for the safekeeping. So they actually didn't hide them very far away from where they lived. They didn't keep them where they lived, they, they probably put them somewhere for safekeeping because there was probably some sort of impending war or, or, or trouble coming, so they didn't want to have them laying around. They wanted to keep them safe, and that's what saved the scrolls, is the fact that they sealed them away 
in the place that was not attacked or deserted or burned or anything like that or ransacked. So that's what preserved the scrolls. And presumably they hid them away and never came back for them because something tragic happened to the people who hid them. They couldn't get them back. And they were Essenes, Peter? <clears throat> Essenes, we call them Essenes. We call them, uh, I like to call them Qumranites or Qumran Jews. Uh, Essenes is kind of like one of the names. Uh, I told you before as I was uh, teaching about Essenes is like there's different kinds of Essenes. Some Essenes might have lived in Qumran, but other MCs did, didn't live in Qumran. And so there were different varieties. So even it is an ideological movement, essentially, that is diverse. And some of them might be living right here, while others be living in Jerusalem. And so uh, it, we call them Essenes hypothetically because of the documents that we have that point to them, that call them that. But we're not even sure why we call them and what that name means. Yeah. So it's like, it's like that's what we get from the ancient history, uh, but we're trying to connect the dots and reconstruct everything. And so the, the documents that were found in the Dead Sea help us to put the documents that we already have from now what we found and kind of trying to connect the dots. But we're still trying, it's not like somebody recorded everything and answered all our questions. So a lot of our hypothesis and understanding of who these people were and what they did and why they did what they did. A lot of that is extrapolation from the little tiny bits of evidence that we found, essentially. But this is the compound. This is the this is their living area. You can see and look that ravine that I showed you. There it is. That curve. <laughs> remember that cave I showed you in the front picture? It's right there. So this is it. They didn't really go far. They started hiding them in, in the hills. But this was the place where they lived. And you can see a lot of rocks that you may, may have a hard time imagining what it was like. But it's actually quite an impressive place.